ago and I was driving back and forth uh, between the parishes, a song came on the radio that I, th I thought, uh, well, it, it, it was, it's about the, um, kind of the opioid crisis that, that, is, that we find ourselves in the midst of. And um, the thing that caught my attention was in the song when it said, your priest is high right now. And I thought to myself, really? <laughs> um, <laughs> I was driving and, and uh, so forth, kind of caught me off guard. But um, so uh, I went back, kind of listened listen to the rest of the words of the song and, and, and I've since heard it a couple of other times on the radio. And um, I, I think that it does a really good job. I don't know if it's, if it's celebrating you know, what's happening, or if it's simply kind of trying to speak to and diagnose it, I, I'll, take the, uh, I'll take the positive side of that and, and assume that it was, that it's, um, uh, you know, kind of trying to describe what, what's going on in our, in our country with all of that, uh, with this situation. I just wanted to read a couple of the, the lyrics to you, uh, again, talking about this sort of um, opioid crisis. The song's called Medicaid. I've got no job and mom pays my bills. I have the Netflix chills. World's out there singing the blues, 20 more dead on the evening news. I think to myself, what's really the use? I'm just like you, I was born to lose. Why, oh why can't you fix me when all I want is to feel numb, but the medication's all gone? Why does God hate me when all I want is to get high? I am bored, nothing to do today. I guess I'll sit around and medicate. I think, again, this does a nice job of describing the situation that a lot of people find themselves in. The, uh, when we were with Archbishop Thompson a couple of weeks ago, uh, he was letting us know that the bishops of Indiana are, are thinking about uh, getting together and writing a letter. They, they do that every now and then, uh, maybe every couple of years, uh, to kind of try and speak to a particular thing that's going on in our, in our state or in our, in our, yeah, in our area. And, uh, and so he was telling us a couple of weeks ago that the bishops are considering writing um, a letter, a pastoral letter to the, the people of Indiana on the issue of the opioid crisis uh, that we find ourselves in. And, and, and we're probably all familiar with, with all of the statistics and, and the different things that are out there. Just a couple. Um, drug overdoses um, among people under the age of 50 in the United States. Drug overdoses is now the leading cause of death. Uh, th that's an amazing statistic. Just her heroin, just one kind of opioid, killed more people in 2015 than guns and car accidents combined. And that's just the people that are dying from it, right? Th we, we, we know, I think, particularly, hopefully, as, as we maybe are, are, are doing what Pope Francis says, which is going out to the margins, we're recognizing that, that lots of other people, while, while it doesn't take their life in, in, in that way, it still is something that, again, many, many countless other people, uh, although it doesn't take their life, still struggle with this issue. And again, we also know that it, there's lots of ways to medicate besides opioids, right? There's food and there's television and there's all these shopping and there's, you know, just a, anything we want, we can try and use it to help medicate ourselves, to help ourselves feel numb, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I think then, you know, as we look at that, we, we, we do well, I think, to pay attention, first of all, to what it is that's going on around us. Because why? Because in the first reading, we're challenged to bring comfort to the people. Comfort my people Israel. And, and, and that's what we, you and I are asked to do, right, in every day of our lives. We're asked to not just celebrate God in here, but to bring comfort to the people that are out in the world as well. And to bring, bring, bring encouragement to them and let them know that God's real, that God loves them. So we're asked to bring comfort into this situation. What's the situation? Well, the situation is where the, a lot and lot of, a lots and lots of people are medicating themselves. And I think, again, that song does a nice job of kind of shining light on, on the rationale that a lot of people go through who are numbing themselves. Some cultures... Some people are asked to bring the gospel into the midst of religious persecution, and other people are asked to bring the good news of the gospel into the midst of, you know, violence and extremism or Christian persecution or poverty, or whatever it might be. You and I are asked to bring the gospel and the good news largely into a culture that is now at the point, I think a lot of it because of our wealth, where the vast majority of people seek to numb themselves, to medicate themselves into a sort of numbness. That's the reality that you and I are asked to go and bring the good news of the gospel into. So we have to pay attention to that and recognize that. 
And so I think when we think about that, and, and, and we think about the rationale that, that's going on with that, I think what we have to do is then ask, okay, so what is it that we're, how, how can we help speak truth into the midst of that darkness, into that, that, that space where people simply want to numb themselves or medicate themselves or, you know, just use something to sort of make the pain go away, right? What is it that we can offer to people? And I think one of those things that we offer to people is what we celebrate right now in the sense of the season of Advent. We celebrate that the church provides us a rhythm to our lives. It speaks to the need and it addresses the rhythm of life. In this season of Advent, which is the beginning of our church year, in the season of Advent, we're encouraged to do what? To slow down, to spend some time reflecting, maybe to give, give something up in, you know, some small thing, make some small sacrifice during the season, to wait in, in, in expectation, right? To spend more time in prayer, perhaps, and, and, and in silence, right? Why? To prepare ourselves then so we, we kind of slow down a little bit in order to prepare ourselves for this great mountaintop experience, this celebration of Christmas that's coming, and then eventually we head back to, into the season of Lent, which is again another time of preparation, of recognizing a little bit of our sinfulness and, and, and again denying ourselves things and kind of slowing down and then ramping up for again the great celebration of the season of Easter. The church provides this rhythm of life to us, right? It provides the, the, this, this rhythm of, of slowing down and then celebrating. Even some of our feast days, or some of our saints' days, we call them feast days. They're supposed to be celebratory. But then there's other days where we're preparing ourselves to celebrate, right? There's this rhythm of life that the church provides. And in the Old Testament, the Israelites would thank God all the time for the rhythm of life that God had given them. They thanked God. We thank you, Lord, for this, this way of life that you teach us. This rhythm that you've given us in your laws. And some people will look at, oh, you know, God's telling the shellfish and all these other, they're so dumb. Well, the Israelites didn't think that those laws were dumb. They thanked God for them. They said, we thank you, Lord, for, you know, giving us this, again, this rhythm to our life. And it's not just a yearly thing, right? Even within our day, the church is inviting us to, to, to recognize and to take some time to slow down and to pause and, and, and maybe take some time in the morning or the evening to, to pray, Right? Within every Mass, we do that. We see this rhythm playing out. At the very beginning of Mass, we call to mind our sinfulness. We call to mind the things that we've done that we know we should not have done, and we give those to God, and then we, that, that echoes, and then we have other times where we're singing, and we're, we're praising God, and we're, we're celebrating and rejoicing. I think a lot of times what happens is, is that if you don't have that rhythm of life, if you don't have that rhythm of life in your day, in your week, even in the week the church asks us to, Fridays, a day of penance, a day of giving something up, of not eating meat or doing some other sacrifice. But then Sunday, this great day of celebration. If you don't have that rhythm of life, if you don't have that in your life, then every day starts to become the same. And when every day starts to become the same, then you seek to simply flee that. Because that gets really ominous. When you just look at your life and you say, wow, you know, if I, if I live 40 more years, then I just have 40 years of this flatline existence. Then that gets really burdensome. Right? But when there's this rhythm to life and this recognition of things, then it starts to be something that, again, can help me escape that in a healthy way. Right? I think also what we hear in that is that, oddly enough, in the gospel reading, what's John the Baptist saying to prepare for? He's saying, repent. Repentance. Right? And that sounds like we hear John and we hear his outfit and his food, and we're like, that guy's crazy. Right? He had to be just insane and angry. But in reality, the, the invitation to repentance is actually good news. Because here's what all these people medicating are experiencing. We all know our shortcomings. We all experience and feel the pain that comes from our, our choices, our sinful choices, the, the, the destructive choices that we make. We're all aware that we have that. No, anybody that would deny that our actions can have negative consequences on us is not living in reality. So we all have that. The, the invitation to repentance is the invitation to say, hey, there's somebody beyond you who can deal with your sins and help you and take them away. Because I think a lot of these people that, again, are seeking, and, and a lot of, maybe it's even us in the church at times, in seeking to medicate ourselves, it's like we, we know our sinfulness, but yet we don't want to let God in to help us with that. 
And so, you know, if think about a person that's out there that has these, that knows that they're, you know, again, they're experiencing the effects of sin in their life, but no one's telling them that there's anything they can do about it. So that too, I think, a lot of times causes people to simply try and medicate and numb the pain that comes from that, just, just simply try to deal with it through that. And so, again, as, as we enter into the season of Advent and we're in the midst of it, I think we need to recognize the great gift that it is, the great gift that the rhythm of life is, as the world is out there telling us to just, again, continue to you know, run around frantically and so forth. I think we, we, we do well to pause and, and, and thank God, first of all, for the gift of, that, that he gives us in this, in this, this Advent season, the season of this, this entire rhythm of life, right, that God gives us. Are we entering into that, right? Are we, are we allowing the seasons of, of our week, of our day, of our year, are we allowing those gifts uh, to be a part of, of who we are um, and, and, and to be something that we interiorize and we give thanks for you know, do, are, are we thanking God for these things? Um, and I think by doing that and going out and bringing that to other people, we can help provide an alternative to the people who simply seek and experience pain in their lives and know or, or, or choose to not do anything else other than try and medicate that pain away.